You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, listeners should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Individuals should not enter into an options transaction until they have read and understood the disclosure document, characteristics, and risks of standardized options. Available by visiting the OCC.com or by contacting your broker, any exchange on which options are traded, or the Options Clearing Corporation at 125 South Franklin Street, number 1200, Chicago, Illinois, 60606. The Options Industry Council is an industry resource provided by the Options Clearing Corporation, collectively OCC. Any strategies discussed are strictly for illustrative and educational purposes only and are not to be construed as an endorsement or solicitation to buy or sell securities. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. And the Wide World of Options radio show is one of several resources investors can utilize to learn more about options. Other resources OIC offers include webinars, articles, and self-guided options-related coursework. For more information, check out www.optionseducation.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Benzaquin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OIC's Wide World of Options. I'm your host, Mark Benzaquin, and I wanted to pick up where we left off last month as we continue our options journey by talking about pricing this time around. For today's episode, we're fortunate to have two guests with us tackling pricing, but from two different perspectives, which I think is interesting. So to start, we've got my friend and colleague, Ken Keating, in the studio with me today, and we're going to look at pricing from an investor's perspective. So Ken, welcome back, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Mark. I'm happy to be here today. So Ken, let's start at the beginning, and we're going to talk about pricing uh, and look at some of the things that you're going to be covering in your upcoming February webinars so to begin, let's start with where option prices come from and who makes the determination as to what an option might be worth. Sure. So when you're looking at options pricing, what you're really looking at is the crowdsourced prices of the bids and offers for options at that particular point in time. Now, when you're talking bids and offers, uh, a, a bid is what a an investor or the market is willing to pay for the contract, and the offer is what they're willing to sell it for. Correct. So let's say you pull up your favorite stock and you look at an options chain and you see the market on a call is $1 bid offered at $120, mm -hmm. 100 up, meaning that there's 100 contracts on the bid, there's 100 contracts on the offer. So you know at any given time, right now, well, at least at this point in time, you can sell 100 contracts for a dollar and you could buy 100 contracts for a dollar twenty. So that's what's known as the bid ask spread. So right. the midpoint is a dollar ten. So in trader speak, we would call that fair value. So it's fair value at one ten. Traders are willing to buy it for a dollar, but at the same time sell it at one twenty. So when I was a market maker, I was making a two sided market. I was willing to buy that option for a dollar and at the same time sell it for a dollar twenty. So Theoretically, whether I buy it or sell it, I get 10 cents of edge on either side of the trade. That's how a market maker makes their money. They're not playing direction or, you know, well, some traders play direction, but, you know, traders trade for edge and that's what right. they're trading. They're trading that bid ask spread and hedging it off with options and other stock throughout the day to 
theoretically lock in that edge. Okay, and and I'm glad that you brought up uh, brought up that fair value, that midpoint, because that's something that we're going to get into in the second half of our discussion today. Um, so, uh, what you're telling us is that the pretty much any market participant, whether it's an investor, uh, a market maker, a hedge fund, what have you, those market participants all submit their bids and their offers uh, to the exchange. The exchange then disseminates the the best bid or offer to the public, and that's what we see on our option chains, and that's what we go uh, trade for uh, or trade off of. Correct. So let me ask you this. If we've got, if we're looking at, say, a $50 strike, and stock is trading for $55. So the call is what we call in the money because uh, uh, theoretically we can purchase the underlying security, in this case for $50 when it's trading 55 in the market. So we call that in the money. If that option is trading for $7, what can the investor discern from that $7 price uh, as to the value of the option? $5 of that is going to be in the money, right? Correct. And what about the rest? So $5 of that $50 call with a stock trading 55 would be called intrinsic value. So it's in the money by $5 because it's the right to buy that stock at 50 even though it's trading for 55 So intrinsically, it's worth $5. That's also known as parity. Um, we'll talk a little more about that in my second presentation um, the following week. But um, the extra $2... Okay, because the option's trading for $7. So the difference between $7 and its intrinsic value of five, that's $2. That's the amount of extrinsic value that is in the option. So we would call that the time premium left in the option. So an in, in, money, in, in the money option has both intrinsic and extrinsic value, whereas, say, an at the money or an out of the money option is comprised of nothing but extrinsic value. It has no intrinsic value. So right. um, not all options have uh, both intrinsic and extrinsic value. Only in the money options have both. Okay. Yeah. And that extrinsic value, that time value, the reason we call it time value or time premium um, is because it represents the time frame for something to either go right or wrong in the market. Meaning if I'm buying an option six months out, uh, in addition to paying the intrinsic value of the contract, if any, I'm also, uh, in a sense, renting that option for the next six months for hopefully things to go my way. And as that six months decreases, goes from six months to five months, et cetera, et cetera, that time value is going to shrink, right? And right. Uh, that's what we call time decay. Right. So, you know, in options... Uh, premium, an option is a wasting asset. So every time we, every day we get closer and closer to expiration, it loses a little bit of value. But it only loses the time premium portion of that option, the extrinsic value. The intrinsic value stays, okay? It's the extrinsic value that is subjected to time decay or theta. Um, your Greek theta is how much your option is expected to lose on a daily basis. But it's that extrinsic value that decays, not the intrinsic value. Okay. Um, and, and then the, the phrase time is money, something that obviously we're all very familiar with that applies to options as well. If, if I'm a seller and I'm going to be selling a contract, I have an idea what my risk is, uh, with the options expiring tomorrow, right? Uh, I have an idea of what's going to happen in the market over the next 24 hours. I have no idea what's going to happen over the next two years. So uh, as we go further out in time, those options are going to cost more money, right? Absolutely, because time is money. And the more time that you pay for, the more it's going to cost you. So obviously, an option that expires in a week is going to um, cost less than an option that expires in two years. Mm -hmm. You know, The more time that's embedded in that option, the more time premium is in that option. And likewise, the more expensive that option will be in terms of uh, price. Right. So the further we go out in time, I look at it from a seller's perspective that as a seller, I've got significantly more risk on my hands going out two years in the market versus you know going out two days. So as a seller, because I've got so much more risk, uh, in order for me to accept that risk, I'm going to need significantly more premium to do so. Exactly. And you know, there's all kinds of moving parts when it comes to options. And uh, Vega, your option sensitivity to changes in volatility is probably one of the most important factors. But as your options get further and further out on the curve, they're more Vega sensitive. So 
not only do you have to worry about movement on stocks, say if you're short options, you have to worry about implied volatility, um, if it, the stock pays a dividend or not, um, you might have to worry about a dividend. You're, you know, you're more sensitive to interest rate changes. So mm-hmm. the further out you go, you know, all these factors kind of come into play um, right. um, at varying levels. And those factors, those moving parts that you're talking about, those are the different components that go into that options price. Can you tell us what those moving parts are, what those variables are. Sure. So when you put your, the variables that go into a price and model, there's the stock price, Mm -hmm. there's your strike price, there's your time to expiration, how much time is left in that option. There is interest rates, there are dividends, if the stock pays a dividend, and then there's implied volatility. Now, out of all those factors, most of those are pretty much known, right? So at any given time, we know what the stock price is trading for. We know what our strike price is. Interest rates, we kind of have an idea what they are today. You know, we can kind of um, anticipate what they might be in the future. So those are kind of somewhat known. Dividends gets a little more dicey further out. We don't know if a company is going to continue to pay dividends or increase them or decrease them. Um but the implied volatility, that's the wild card in options pricing. It's what all traders are trying to solve for, and it's based on the supply and demand for options. So as options get bid up, there's more demand than supply. Traders would say implied volatility. Naturally, those prices would get bid up higher. We would say that implied volatility is going higher. So one way to look at implied volatility is to equate it to options prices. So as option prices are expensive and they get bid up, you can infer that implied volatility is expensive, is getting bid up. And likewise, if there's a bigger supply of options than demand, prices will go lower. And that will naturally result in lower implied volatility Mm -hmm. and lower prices. And and implied volatility is such an important aspect of options pricing um, that we devote a... um, a, a large section of our website, or I should say we've got uh, a tremendous amount of content on our website uh, dedicated to implied volatility. So uh, while it's a more uh, intermediate concept than what we're talking about here with options basic and uh, basics of pricing, it's a, a very, very important concept to know. Uh, and so for listeners, uh, I can uh, I definitely encourage you to uh, go to our website uh, and take a look at all of the information that we have on uh, uh, implied volatility, as well as the Greeks, which uh, Ken had just mentioned. So Ken, certainly appreciate that overview on options pricing. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to go to our website, optionseducation.org, uh, check out the events section on the page and register for Ken's two upcoming February webinars. Um, He's going to be taking a much deeper dive than the high-level overview that we just covered, uh, as well as talking about some different things that uh, that we didn't talk about today that he will be addressing in his webinar. Um, Ken, let's get off topic for a second. Uh, I've been in the business 25 plus years. I know our colleagues at OCC, uh, those of us on the investor education desk, certainly have a very long history and experience in options. You're no different. Let's take a minute. Tell me about what got you into the market. What got you into options? Uh, more importantly, how about this? What was your impression of your first day on the trading floor? What were things that were going through your head? Oh, my God. So my first day on the trading floor, it's like sensory, sensory overload. And, and when was this? Back in the mid-90s, I'm guessing? Yeah, this was 1992. Oh, yeah, early. Okay. 1992, yeah. Okay. So I basically started out as a clerk on the floor of the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. And I got the job. It's funny because I was I was bartending at the time. I was always interested in trading numbers. The stock market always fascinated me, but I never really knew how to get into the business. And I was uh, working at this restaurant and I was opening the bar that I was working in. And I, these two guys that I had known forever, I hadn't seen them in years. They came in and they started drinking at like two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> in San Francisco. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's great seeing you guys, but, you know, why don't you guys get a job or something? Like, what are you doing here drinking in the middle of the afternoon? They said, oh, we just got off of work. I said, really? What do you do? And they explained to me they're working for market makers. I said, what's a market maker? And I realized that there was a trading floor in San Francisco. And I thought, well, maybe that's what I want to do. So I went and I applied to every trading firm on the floor of the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. 
And one clearing firm hired me. A clearing firm is basically a bank for traders. So if you're trading your own money, you deposit money at a clearing firm, they clear and settle all your trades and uh, run your sheets for you. And, you know, they're basically your bank. And I worked for the clearing firm running sheets and executing futures orders and executing buy and sell stock orders, things like that. And then I ended up um, befriending a, a partner at one of the trading firms in San Francisco. And he said, you know, I was ex executing stock, NASDAQ stocks, buying and selling in the Microsoft pit and buying and selling stocks to hedge the traders in the pit. And he looked at me, he said, hey, why don't you come work for us? We'll pay you a little more. You do exactly the same thing. And I said, done. <laughs> <laughs> so... I basically ended up working for this trading firm and they put me through their training program and I became a trader and the rest is history. Excellent. Yeah. So, the rest is history for the sure. The rest is history. Yeah. So. I, yeah. It's, it, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. Excellent, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and for listeners interested in attending Ken's February webinars, uh, you can do so via the event section of our OIC website, optionseducation.org. I highly encourage everyone to register and attend. Uh, Ken's going to be covering a great deal more information than our time allowed for today. Um, he's going to be taking a deeper dive into pricing, talk about different pricing models, which transitions nicely into my next guest, Colin Fisher from OCC's Pricing and Margins team. Colin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited yeah. to be here. Yeah, Callan, thank you. Um, listen, Ken just explained pricing from an investor's perspective. Um, let's take a, a look at the flip side of the coin. Um, let's look behind the scenes and look at pricing from an operational perspective. So to start, Ken and I were talking about um, those bid-ask markets, right? What you can buy an option for, what you can sell it for, uh, et cetera. But um, the reason that's important is because people call us, or I should uh, say people email us um, or chat with us on our website, uh, the investor education team. We get a lot of questions about what is the closing price of options, XYZ, $50 strike, that expiring tomorrow, uh, et cetera. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because it, is, you know we here internally at OCC know options don't have closing prices. They have those closing bid-ask markets that Ken had talked about. Uh, so with that um, on the table, so to speak, um, we also know that OCC computes uh, a theoretical value for each and every option contract each and every day that the market is open. Um, and these are called mark prices uh, that OCC uses to, uh, among other things, margin our clearing firms that Ken had mentioned. So what can you tell us about that in terms of OCC mark prices? Why does OCC create these mark prices? Um, and how do, they, uh, how do they calculate them? How do they arrive at these values? Yeah, so there's, uh, I think, 17 different exchanges now, options exchanges. And uh, most products are dual listed. So because of that, you may have different closing prices on different exchanges for the same option strike for that same product. So what OCC's role is, is to um, create one mark price for each strike and each product so that you have the same price at the end of each day for um, an, an option contract. Um, so that's one of the ways... That, that's what the main reason why we do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now, let me ask you this. So so we, we do these mark prices um, kind of to smooth out the, you know, any pricing variances between exchanges uh, or something like that. So how does, uh, well, l let me ask you this. How does OCC arrive at these? I know that, um, you know, we've got a proprietary algorithm that we use. Uh, what are some of the, can we talk about, even though it's proprietary, can we talk about some of the different inputs sure, that we sure. use for these prices? Yeah, so the smoothing algorithm, it is proprietary, but it's based on the Black-Scholes model. Um, you know, how the model works is it will, it will take the best bid and the best ask from all 17 exchanges, and what it does is it creates a price and a volatility at each strike. Then once that's determined through an iterative process, it will smooth it out to make it a, like a smooth volatility uh, curve. Mm -hmm. So instead of having like a jagged curve because maybe a bid ask is wider on one strike and tighter on another strike, it goes through this iterative process to make a smooth curve of volatility. And so some of the prices might change a little bit. Um, what you do, why we do that is to create 
um, a volatility curve which creates prices that are free of arbitrage, um, satisfy put call parity, um, no monotonicity issues, meaning that you know puts should all um, you know go down from the highest strike to the lowest strike. Mm-hmm. Uh, calls should all go up or should all go. Yeah, vice versa. As right. You understand what I'm saying. Right. So as as call strikes go lower, the price gets more expensive. As put prices, uh, I'm sh- sorry, as put strikes go up, the put prices get more expensive. So OCC does all of this um, smoothing to ensure that, for example, you know maybe there is a bid ask of. Uh, you know, something kind of out of whack, you know, maybe in, you know, three months down the road. So what we do is we kind of look at that. And while we're cognizant of that, we don't necessarily let that affect all of the other prices in this security. And we do this for every single option, every single strike, every single month um, or expiration date. And we do this every single trading day. Every single trading day. Right. 1.5 million options. 1.5 million options. Yeah. So so one of the reasons, you know, we do get, you know, some questions, some of them come from you guys, and, and, and the people will say, well, how come you just don't use the midpoint of the bid ask? Right. And so when you have some of these very liquid stocks, that, that might work perfectly fine, mm-hmm. that you could use the midpoint. Um, and usually you'll find that our theoretical mark prices are right in line with those midpoints for those types of securities. Okay. It's the securities that are less liquid. Um, and, and by liquidity, what we're talking about, um, we're, we're, Liquidity, we're talking about volume, um, maybe open interest for options, things like that. Liquidity isn't something that we generally talk about here at OCC because it's so subjective um, for so many people. Um, but what you're what you're talking about are the more heavily traded securities versus securities that aren't so heavily traded. Yeah, and the ones that aren't heavily traded might not have as many market makers. Right. So you're going to have less people making markets in those as well. Mm-hmm. And so the more market makers you have in a security, you know, the tighter and more efficient that market will tend to be. Right. Right. So the the competition kind of squeezes down um, those bid ask, make the tighter markets kind of easier to figure out pricing for something like that versus a security that may not trade, not a, not even every day, but may not even trade every week. Yes. Um, so, yeah. for example, one of the things that people ask us uh, at Investor Education is, well, I see the last price for XYZ was $3, and yet you're valuing it at a dollar. Um, what people don't realize is that last traded price may have been three weeks ago or yes. it could have been six months ago. So that last traded price is, is kind of irrelevant. But what, what I thought was interesting when it comes to pricing, uh, those that 29-point model, some of the inputs that we look at aren't just that particular strike. We're not looking at the $50 XYZ call expiring in three weeks. We're looking at the $45 call. We're looking at the $55 call. We're looking at it expiring three months from now and six months from now. And and that all of those inputs goes into that, you know, soup yep. that gives us the price for that XYZ $50 call expiring in three weeks. That's correct. That's why it's the smoothing algorithm. Yeah. Right. So yeah. It, it's it's taking all those bids and asks. And it's trying to find a nice smooth curve. Right. Irrelevant if you have bid and asks that are wider on certain strikes than others within that given month. Mm-hmm. Um, each month is is smoothed itself, though. So you you, you do not go from uh, smoothing a November uh, set of contracts with your your January. It, it is okay. each month separately. And there's reasons for that, right? You're going to have dividends that land in a certain month yeah, and good dividends point. that don't land in a, a given month. And then you're going to have... You know, your interest rates are going to be different throughout that curve, mm-hmm. your interest rate curve. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of different reasons for that. But, you know, I think, you know, you brought up the last traded price um, thing. And it's a, it's a good question, and we get it quite often. They buy a call for $5 at two thirty. It never, let's say it never trades again. You know, and we'll get an email saying, well, no one ever traded it. I traded it at two thirty. How come we're not marking it at $5? That's where I traded it. People might have rallied, you know, $4 in that 30 minutes, and it's mm-hmm. a 50 delta Call and that option actually should be worth seven dollars. So to manage the mark to market and manage the risk of the portfolios, you really need to you know recalculate all the option prices with the end of day closing price. Okay, and uh, the end of day closing price you're talking about the closing price of the security. Of, yep, gotcha. exactly. Um, so let me ask you this: so we've got the bid ask. Um, do we ever use prices that are are, are mark prices ever calculated outside of that bid ask? 
from time to time, so like we have, you know, like I said, we have 1.5 million options. We are within the best bid and best ask at a very, very high percentage. Um, we do go through a review process on PM where if there's uh, a number of options outside of the bid ask that my team will look into that. It could have to do with a, a dividend, a dividend forecast that could have been incorrect from the vendor. Mm -hmm. So we look into all those different things to see why our price is slightly outside of the MBBO, and we'll look into those. Um, but because there's not that many, it, it, you know, my team spends two hours a night looking into those. Okay. And, and let me ask you this. Um, how about does it affect the uh, option price um, the trading cutoff. So, for example, we've got uh, some securities trade to uh, 3 p.m. Chicago time, some trade to 3.15 yes. uh, Chicago time. Some of those 3.15 um, securities uh, on expiration, um, they may uh, those contracts may cease trading at 3. Um, how does all that work, and how does OCC take all that into account? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of the ETFs, uh, tend to trade till 315. Mm -hmm. The uh, underlying actually closes at three. So you and and, and you know the, one of the key inputs to the smoothing algorithm is end of day best bid and ask. So using a 315 bid and ask and then aligning it with a three o'clock close doesn't make any sense. So we've worked with um, our exchanges, SIBO uh, and Nasdaq, both supply us with three o'clock snapshots of the bid and ask from their market makers. Um, that we use to align it with the three o'clock close. So it's a special file that comes in just for those products. And then you can compare apples to apples instead of using a 315. Gotcha. It asks with three o'clock oh, close. That makes sense. I like that. Um, all right, uh, Colin, excellent. Thank you for that. Let me just ask you one more question. Um, we were talking about bid and ask and how those inputs are used for um, uh, two of the inputs that uh, go into figuring out what an option is worth. Um, what if there is no bid and ask? For example, with the flex contract, which um, for those of you that don't know, a flex contract is simply a customized contract that an investor can customize the terms in terms of the strike price, expiration date, um, whether it settles uh, in the morning or the afternoon, uh, et cetera. But because they're not publicly quoted, there is no public bid and ask. So how does OCC uh, derive prices for a flex contract? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we use what's called interpolation or extrapolation from our standard contracts, which do have bid ass. So uh, in the example of, let's say there's a flex contract that someone came up with a 150-150 strike, a strike that doesn't exist, and they want to they wanna have that contract go out to February 6th. What would happen is the smoothing algorithm will smooth its standard contracts on February 9th. And what it will take is it will take the implied volatility in Greeks and it will use those standard contracts to come up and try to fit that 150, 150. So what it will do is probably look very close at the 150 strike and take a lot of the characteristics from the 150 strike, the standard 150 strike, and extrapolate or interpolate those to the flex contract. And that's all part of the smoothing process. Okay, interesting. Well, thank you. Colin, really, you know, terrific news, uh, terrific information. We love to... Um, get information from people behind the scenes. You know, Ken and I were always um, kind of more of an external uh, participant in the market, and we still, you know, pretty much are. Uh, but it's interesting to see how things work from operational perspectives uh, behind the scenes. So uh, thank you for sharing your expertise with that. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Um, let's shift gears for a second. You've been in the business for a very long time. You just uh, told me uh, earlier before we um, before we went on the air that you've been with OCC for 10 years now. Yeah. Um, tell me about your history in the, the, the markets. How did you get your start? Yeah, so I went to uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago, so just a few miles from here, and uh, graduated in 99. And I, uh, as you guys know, that was kind of the dot-com boom. Mm -hmm. where I think the NASDAQ was up like 800% 800 from 95 to 2000. So it was a, a kind of a good time to... Um, you know, get into the, the markets. And I knew someone at the CBOE, yeah. and he said I'd come down and clerk. So I started going down there my sophomore year of college. Uh, clerk for two years, uh, anytime they'd let me down there, summer, Christmas, you know, anytime I had a break. Right. Um, I joined the firm uh, right when I graduated and started trading, you know, pretty much right away. 
Uh, I was there for eight years, then went upstairs in stream quotes for three years. I uh, went over the uh, CME and stream quotes in soybeans and uh, wheat for three more years prior to coming mm-hmm. to OCC. To OCC. Yeah, it, it's funny. Pretty much anyone in the business, um, you know, from the traders uh, side of it is a journeyman. Meaning that, yeah, I mean, we go from firm to firm to firm to firm throughout our career. We're still doing the same thing, uh, just maybe wearing a different trading coat. Uh, so, yeah, interesting to see that your experience kind of aligns and matches up with ours. So, uh, excellent, great information. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that behind the scenes perspective. Um, and thanks to all of our listeners and supporters out there. Um, lastly, I, I want to uh, again remind everyone to register for. Ken's upcoming pricing sessions. Uh, and as always, please feel free to send us your questions via email at options at the OCC.com or live chat with us on our website, optionseducation.org. Thanks again for joining us, everyone. Take care, and we'll be talking with you again very soon. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you've heard on today's show, email options at the OCC.com or visit www.optionseducation.org and chat with OIC's Investor Education Team. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Subscribe to the OIC YouTube channel, like them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter at options.edu, and follow their page on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wide World of Options. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs>